Welcome to Stream of Conscience, brought to you by Democracy for America, Fairfield County, where we believe that change is possible and you can make it happen. I'm your host, John Hartwell. Our guest today is folk singer Tom Nielsen. He spent a lifetime working for social change in Africa, in Latin America, and here in America as well. Uh, Tom, welcome back to Stream of Conscience. Thank you, John. So the big news for you is that you've just been nominated for an award. Tell us about that. It's uh, an award called Songs for Freedom. It's in conjunction with the 150th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation. And that was in? Well, it was in 62, but it was signed by Lincoln on January 1st of 63. So, so 1862 this. was when he was working on it, and 1863, January the 1st, was when it became into force. All right. And so tell me about the award. Why, why were they uh, giving an award for this? Apparently, they were looking for songs that they can use in conjunction with whatever ceremony mm -hmm. that they're going to have in Washington, D.C. And so I sent them one of mine that I wrote a few years ago that was also in conjunction with uh, the whole issue of civil rights. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was selected as one of the, of the, of the songs. So tell me about the, the song. What's in it? Teresa El Amin, who is director of the Southern Anti-Racism Network, called me up and asked me if I would come down to North Carolina mm -hmm. to do a concert because American Renaissance, which is a white supremacist organization, was right. having their national conference in North Carolina. Whereabouts? I believe it was in Charlotte. Okay. And she said, we can't let them come to our state without a response right. of us for against them. And so I called up my friend Daryl Mock from Washington, D.C., and he was the MC and also performed, and I wrote this song for it. And what's and the song called? It's called Running for the Gold. It's a song about Jesse Owens. Um, it, it, since I will be playing it later, uh, Jesse's name was James Cleveland, James Cleveland Owens, and his nickname was J.C. Ah, okay. That's what his family called him. And when they moved from Alabama to Cleveland, when his mother enrolled him in public school, she said, this is J.C. Owens, and the administrator heard Jesse, and that's how Jesse got his name. Okay. And there's a number of references. <clears throat> Avery Brundage, who anyone connected to the sports world at all or the Olympics will recognize Avery's name. Sure. Because forever he right. was head of the Olympic Committee. Right. He was also a Nazi sympathizer. Didn't know that. And he, his nickname uh, back in, in the 30s was Slavery Avery, ah. particularly among the black community. Okay. <clears throat> but among others who were in solidarity because he did not want the black athletes to go to Berlin right. in 36. 1936 when it was held in Berlin and Hitler was hoping to make that a showcase for the Nazi party and the right. regeneration of the Germans. And Hitler said at that time that he would, when he knew the athletes were coming, he said he would never shake a black man's hand, mm. which he ultimately did do with Jesse, but um, Jesse felt the greatest insult or, or, or uh, shunning was to be completely ignored by FDR, who mm. never sent a telegram or a letter or any good wishes or, or, or anything. After he won the gold medals. After he won the four medals, and right. or to any of the athletes. Mac Robinson won a silver medal. Mm -hmm. Mac was Jackie's older brother. Oh. And when Mac came back to the States, the only job he could get was pushing a broom. And he used to wear his USA Olympic jacket on, on mm. the job. Mm. And a lot of white folk didn't like that. Mm. He was being a little uppity with, yeah. his, with his circles on his back. You know, it's really incredible, <coughs> um, the, the way this country was run in those days. Well... We're right, regressing in mm -hmm. a way, if you are, because with what is called the new Jim Crow, um, with policies that we're seeing from the voter ID, right. from the murders that are happening on the street that people don't even get picked up for until after the fact, you know, where people have a, I'm trying to remember the name of the right to stand your ground. Stand your ground, right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And and, and I would even say that the high stakes testing is what we're doing with, you know, Arnie Duncan just taking it even further, Arnie being um, Obama's Secretary of Education. I think this whole high stakes institutionalized testing is, is another way of using 
education as a, as a divider because mm, we still have, uh, yeah, and, and, and our prison system. Yeah. Uh, where we have the, the largest per capita in the world of people incarcerated. And I don't have the exact percentiles, but the number of black and Latino people in jail compared to the number of white per capita is quite disparate. It is. Uh, and you mentioned a moment ago the new Jim Crow. In fact, there is a, a book that came out last year that makes that argument and <coughs> talks about all the ways that since the days of segregation have been legally ended, how the system has been reconfigured in order to continue to oppress black people and, and Hispanics now as mm -hmm. well. Um, and I think, uh, as you just said, the numbers are pretty convincing, uh, especially when you look at the prison system and you see uh, the huge disparity in the number of, or the percentage of black people, primarily black males, who are put in prison for a variety of things. And then when they come out, of course, they are, from that point on, second-class citizens. Uh, they can't vote. They can't get jobs very easily. Um, you know, they sometimes can't, they can't live in public housing. It's, uh, it's, it's, pretty, uh, it's pretty amazing. And, and we're the, uh, I, there may be other countries, but as far as countries that are, are referred to as industrial, Western countries, other countries don't deny the vote mm. to people when they're in jail, and mm -hmm. especially when they come out of jail. Right. You know, right. so that's, who are we disenfranchising? Again, disproportionately, we are disenfranchising black and Latino citizens. Right. You know, and, and we can look at deportation as well is, is part of that because Obama has deported way, he's deported more than anyone's ever deported. Yep. It's been over, what is it? Uh, it's, it's, in the, it's in the hundreds of thousands. It is. It yeah. is. It's, it's, it was because it was like 400,000. It's been over a million people. Yes. About, about 1,100,000 people in his four years. Mm -hmm. And that is part of the whole new Jim Crow in terms of how people are treated in this country. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's still here. When you uh, actually, w the, the system, of course, is not designed to encourage people to vote in any way, shape, or form. <coughs> uh, no. You know, the, I, the, the barriers that are put up to simple registration, to uh, voting at the polls, to uh, getting information about candidates in any way other than mm -hmm. by served by the people who have the most money. Uh, I actually helped teach a class on behalf of the League of Women Voters about voting and about getting registered to vote. And in fact, the number, the percentage of people who actually vote compared to those who could, if you took all classes of people and talked about those who should be registered and those who should be voting on voting day, it's about 38% of the country actually votes in an election. That's, that's high for the states, for 38% to come out. Usually that's... Yeah. yeah that's and so then thing. you think that a, a, an election is decided by half of that, and half of 38 is 19%. And so, mm -hmm. that, you know, we're, we really are, even at the best of times, the government is run uh, or is selected by a very narrow group of people. Right. And, uh, and the people who have access to the polls. It's, it's, it's everything that you said, plus that they are physically able to get there. Yes. That have, has a job that they could take time off or get there before or after, don't have to worry about being back for children. Right. Things that all are skewed to people who have more money. Yes. Or more, just so more So for example, we, we vote on a Tuesday. <laughs> for some reason. I don't know how it is that Tuesday got selected as the day, but let's say that you are a, a working class person who has to take public transportation to get to a job that's an hour away, and you need to be there by, let's say, 8.30, 9 o'clock in the morning, and so you've got to get up, you've got to take care of your family, you have to get on the bus or the train, whatever, you go to your job, you work your job, then you have to reverse that, you get home, you take care of the kids. At what point do you have a chance to go and vote? Because, by the way, your job is where you spent all day, but your place mm -hmm. that you vote is where you live, somewhere close. So it's, it, the whole system is set up not to be friendly to people voting. Well, the other piece that dissuades people from voting is keeping other candidates off the ballot. Yes. Keeping candidates off the podium. Yeah. And a lot of people in this country don't have no idea how, that there are, what, five, six people running for president mm. right now. And... Those other four, and, and we, could, we could count two who have qualified in enough states on the ballot to win the election, 
mathematically, mm -hmm. who have qualified for matching funds from mm. the federal government, mm. and two others. Well, I, I can't speak for the other two as how, how many. I think they have qualified for matching money and are on significant number of ballots, at least Rocky is, I think. Um, but they may not have the, the, the poll uh, ratings that... Right. that, that um, they won't be in the debates. Uh, but none of them will be in the debates, right. though. And they don't get covered on, on Fox they or don't MSNBC or anywhere else. <laughs> but, and what isn't reported is the amount of grassroots campaigning, though, mm -hmm. that these other candidates are doing. And that among these disenfranchised people, there is a lot of support. Yeah. And so it's a matter of do these people, with everything that we've just talked about, do they come out to the polls to vote for someone who really represents them rather than a corporate system that doesn't right. and that's trying to stop them and keep them from voting? Let's talk about some of the other things you've been working on at the grassroots level because I know that you travel extensively, you do concerts. Um, people ask you to come, as you just mentioned <coughs> a moment ago, with a concert in North Carolina uh, around the Emancipation uh, proclamation and uh, um, anti-racism things. What what are the other things that you're working on? Well, at home we're trying to shut down the Vermont Yankee. At home you know, for you is Western Massachusetts. Greenfield, Massachusetts, just south of the Vermont border. Mm -hmm. I would guess that people here in Connecticut hear very little, if anything, about Vermont Yankee. Oh uh, yes, you're right. Very little. Yeah. If we think about a nuclear power plant, we're thinking about the one just across the border in New York. Right. Where, by the way, they advertise on the Yankees games, you know, that you know, they, they give you the power report. Uh, you know, yeah. and, and it's well that you should be getting information on that. But, but here, this part of Connecticut is in the, the evacuation zone, not to return. You, you are part of the Chernobyl zone, if you would. Okay. If the containment vessel at Vermont Yankee if something happens to it. So if, 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 it were to if catch Vermont fire. Yankee blew up, what you're saying is that we're downwind and that we would have to leave our homes and never come back. Right. It's, okay. if, if you look at the, this, this vessel, okay, it's seven stories high, just, just to try and imagine, because this isn't something the NRC talks about or mm -hmm. anyone talks about, mm -hmm. but it's seven stories high. It has over 500, it has 530 tons or 350 tons, either way, it's a lot of tons, mm -hmm. of spent fuel. On the site. On site. Mm -hmm. in, in a metal container. Mm -hmm. And if that should go, it would contaminate 25,000 square miles. So circumference is pi r squared. Um, 3 divided by 325, call it 8,000. So we're talking from southern Vermont down to Philadelphia anyway, is right. part of that whole circle mm -hmm. of, that would be contaminated. So basically the entire northeast. Again. And, Very and, much the and entire and northeast the from this region. one reactor. Yeah. Now there's, uh, this, this reactor has the same structure as Fukushima without the backup. Mm. It has had leaks. It has had numerous accidents. This, this, they've lied repeatedly mm -hmm. about what they have and don't have. The school across the road from the nuke got tritium in their water supply. Who knows how long the kids were drinking tritium in their water. Mm. But when they found out, well, they stopped. But there's strontium in the fish in the Connecticut River, mm -hmm. which comes right down through Connecticut, yes, it by does. the way. Yep. Tritium is in the water, mm -hmm. There's, it's in the soil, it's in the air, and the people of Vermont, the legislature, the governor of Vermont, they all want it shut down. But the new Nuclear Regulatory Commission allowed it to stay online mm. and gave it another permit. And <clears throat> unfortunately, our administ presidential administration that we have wants a whole new generation of nukes, 100 right. new nukes. Right. And if this nuke and the other 34 like it in the country are not safe, how can he go ahead with 100 new nukes? And so it's full speed ahead with this nuke and just ignoring. You know, I can't get on a plane with one squirt of toothpaste left 
in a, in a toothpaste tube that says 4.5 ounces on it, even though it's all rolled up. Mm. And, and other things that I can't take on a plane. But, but we have this, it's a, it is a catastrophe. It's a catastrophe every day because the radiation is always getting emitted mm -hmm. all the time. But one, one accident, and it's, and it's successful. It's not like you can't get up to it. We're, we're protesting up there all the time. And if that goes, like you said, it goes the northeast. Mm. And I'm not being sensational about this. Yeah. Um, you can there's you can listen to the scientists from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. It's like listening to the scientists from Monsanto that tell you that all the GMOs are okay to eat. Mm -hmm. Or you can listen to the the real scientists that are concerned about what it's doing to our food supply. And. Um, so that's, I'm, I, food is, has always been a big issue with me too. I have a song on my last CD about food and I have another one that I'm working on for my next CD. But it's, I, I grew up on a farm and um, like my uncle Howard who did, never did anything but farm his whole life, he used to say there's the right way to do it and, and Monsanto's way to do it. <laughs> And it was from Cornell, because Monsanto was hooked right. into Cornell, and right. and he lived in the Finger Lakes, and and uh, it was all biotech. We they've been on this biotech kick for for you know years, for decades. It's not it didn't just happen, but now with um, Vilsack from Iowa, mm -hmm. you know it is is the agriculture secretary. Yeah, it, yes. it's just full speed ahead right. with the biotech industry, right. and it's. There's, there's no oversight. Now, you've been uh, working on Citizens United as well. I yeah, I, I have a song which I played last time on the show. I do a lot of fundraisers for everybody, but I have done them for Citizens United, well, for Move to Amend people mm. as well. Any, whenever they want me to come in and do a show, I'm happy to do it. And what other kinds of shows are you doing? Well, I, I do everything. Um, one thing that I get the most satisfaction out of is when people ask me to come in and help them organize primarily around incinerators, but also coal ash in, in southern Wisconsin. And, and what I do is I write songs for people. Mm -hmm. And sometimes these songs become anthems. I, did, I, did, I wrote this song in southern Wisconsin for the small town of Roqua who were trying to stop Dairyland Power, is, is that it? Through eminent domain, dumping coal ash on their farmland. Mm. And, and, um, and I, I, did a f I did two fundraisers for them, and I, I wrote the song, performed it at the concert. The next morning they took me down to the radio studio and had me record it. Yeah. And they started playing that on the airwaves, mm -hmm. and and this is the, you know there's like the, the Myomess song about the, the the power plant, the the tree burning incinerator. It's called a power plant that we've so far stopped again up in Greenfield. Um, a, a, a song that was nominated a, a year or two ago for music for the earth, for song of the year for music for the earth. Um, but any any time that my mu that I can use my music to help people organize and um, I mean music speaks in many different ways music can educate it can it can help people spiritually and emotionally it can help you know like I, I said this I think last time Pablo Casal said that the artist has a particular responsibility mm. because we have been given a medium that people will listen to whether it's you know theater art music and when, when the written word may not be listened to. You know, and I, I'm just happy whenever anything that I do with my, with my writing and with my, with my music is, is able to be incorporated into other people's work. Well, let's, let's, let's listen to some of your music. All right, then. Um, we do the, the, the Jesse Owens song. There's a couple other references in there. Uh, there's a reference to Julio McCaw, who when Jesse came back with four gold medals, he couldn't get a job. Right. 
And so he used to run races against Julio McCall, and Julio was an old racehorse. Ah. So Jesse was a sideshow for that. Well, we'll, we'll hear the song. All right. He was a sharecropper's son. He was a midnight express. When he was young, his mother took a kitchen knife and cut a tumor from his chest. Went to Ohio for the Buckeyes to run and study at their school. Punched his ticks in 36 to run where Nazis rule. Slavery, Avery told the world that Jesse shouldn't go. Better he should stay at home. Service to Jim Crow. But Jesse knew not to. Everything he's told, he tied the laces on his shoes and went running for the gold. Hitler said he'd never shake a black man's hand. And FDR didn't call, never even sent a telegram. Well, he could run with the whites in Germany, not in Alabama. Right up front on a Berlin train, but not in Texarkana. He could eat with whites in Piccadilly, but not in Caroline. Go to a show with buddies, yeah, but not below the line. Brown shirts, black guards, and gray-green waves, seven military miles long. Jesse said he ran with the strength in his feet and the courage in his lungs. In the summer of 36, he was the fastest we ever saw. By December, he was a sideshow racing. Robinson won silver when he came back home. All they gave him was a broom that he could call his own. But he paved the way for Jackie, for Hank and Willie too. Important to the army how you haul it. Flat feet and venereal infection. 
esophagitis, all reasons for rejection. But Jeffrey's only flaw, from his toenails to his jaw, was a missing testicle upon inspection. testicular action was only a fraction if you're gonna do some killing two gonads must be chilling when tour of duty calls you gotta have the balls now you can be technicality under examination doesn't get detected cause if your anatomy has peculiarity it's probably gonna leave you deselected GI function abnormality schizophrenic psychiatric history and in your underwear you gotta have a pair to be an army uniformity oh we needed one more ball for the army protocol his testicular action was only a fraction if you're gonna do some killing two gonads must be chilling when tour of duty calls you gotta have the balls when tour of duty calls you gotta have the balls Thanks so much for coming on Stream of Conscience. Thank you, John. You're Always a pleasure. That's our show for this week. We hope you enjoyed it. You can find all our shows on YouTube by going to YouTube slash user slash DFATVNet. We're also on Facebook and Twitter. Or you can send comments or suggestions for a show to info at DFA-TV.net. If you'd like to learn more about progressive political action, we meet at 7 p.m. on the first Wednesday of the month at the Silver Star Diner in Norwalk. We'd love to have you join us. Remember, change is possible, and you can make it happen. This has been Stream of Conscience, and I'm your host, John Hartwell. Thanks for watching.